Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics um, of interest to libraries. Um, we uh, Encompass Live is broadcast live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and they are the archives are posted to our website. And I'll show you the end of today's show where you can get um, see all of those. Um, both the live show and our archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So uh, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have. Um, they can sign up for upcoming shows or watch any of our archives. Um, this is the 10th year of Encompass Live, so we have quite a few, we got a lot of archives. <laughs> um, there's a lot of sessions there, um, and there you will find things that, um, as in librarians, we would call historical, I suppose. Um, old sessions, um, there will be some information in there that's out of date, but that's okay. Um, we're librarians, we archive everything, so um, everything is dated though, so just keep that in mind when you're looking at our archives that you will find some um, older things. We do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, book reviews, interviews, uh, demos of software or products, um, mini training sessions. Basically, our only criteria is that it is something that is um, of interest to librarians, something that libraries are doing out there, something we think they could be doing, some new programs or services that might be of interest. Um, and we cover topics for all types of libraries, uh, publics, academic, uh, uh, K-12 schools, um, special libraries. We've had, we've had correction facilities on museums. We're really, really broad. <laughs> um, and we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, things that are specific to what we're doing here at the commission. But we also bring, bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning. On the line with us uh, is Lori, and I didn't ask, uh, Droge? Drogi. Drogi, darn. I should have asked. I got to okay. get better at that. Okay. I always forget. <laughs> Lori Drogi is here, and she is from. Uh, she's going to talk to us about, um, as you can see on the screen here, Pioneers in Violence Prevention Libraries and Rape Crisis Centers. And she's joining us from. Um, now, are you? You're in Kentucky, or? I am. You are okay. Well, because so, I know that you're. This is the green dot is Greater Kentucky and or Greater Cincinnati and Kentucky, and I wasn't exactly sure where you were. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah so right. Covington is, if you imagine where, I don't know how familiar you are, how much you've looked at a map and looked at Kentucky and Ohio and where they join. Mm -hmm. um, but if you know where Cincinnati is, Covington is literally right across the river in Kentucky South. Right, right um, on the border, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so great. That's where All right, so I'll just hand over to you, Lori, to tell us all about, um, go ahead with your presentation. Awesome, thank you, Krista. Uh, okay, so, and thank you, to everybody who is listening and watching today, I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, so I have worked at rape crisis centers and domestic violence programs probably for about, for almost 10 years now. Um, and I, I love that this has given me an opportunity to partner with my local libraries in the way that it has, um, because I really think that these kinds of partnerships give us such a great capacity to make our communities healthier and stronger and happier. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself first and I'll give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about. Um, and throughout the course of this webinar, if you have any questions or concerns, throw them up in the, the chat box or the question box and Krista can call my attention to them and we'll definitely have some time at the end for a little bit more of a discussion, uh, if you guys are interested in that. I know I'm super interested in discussion and hearing back from you. So we have lots of fun ways for me to hear back from you in this particular presentation. Um, so the first thing I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, and then I want to get a feel for who's in the room. And then the particular violence prevention strategy that I implement uh, with my agency, which is called, we do the, 
our program is called Green Dot GCKY. So as Krista mentioned, that stands for Greater Cincinnati in Kentucky. Um, and we are part of the Women's Crisis Center, which is the local rape crisis domestic violence shelter. So the program we do is called Green Dot. And I'll tell you a little bit about Green Dot. We'll spend eh, probably 10, 15 minutes on that. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about specifically how I have brought Green Dot into my work with libraries in one particular community um, and hopefully that will give you guys some ideas for different ways that you might be able to partner uh, with your local rape crisis center or other agencies in your community um, so uh, those pictures on as you see on the right hand side of the screen are me if you guys didn't get to see the quick wave that I did at the very beginning of the webinar um, so that's me. So if you can imagine me talking, go for it. If you don't want to, that's okay too. Um, when I was growing up, I was that kid who loved to read. Uh, we went to the library regularly and I had that favorite book that I checked out pretty much a bajillion times. Like when we had the little cards, you could pull up the card and see that it was basically only my name on that card. <laughs> um, and my mom took me to the story times. Uh, but as I got older, I started to see libraries, or I guess I remained seeing libraries as places that I could go to get any book that I want, that I wanted. Um, now, I, I have a different view of libraries. I still see them as a place where I can get really cool books, um, but I also see them, and probably primarily more so, uh, I see them as a place for communities where people can join together regardless of their backgrounds, how much money they have or what they believe for fun programs, for educational programs, um, just to build a sense of community and relationships with each other. And to me, I find that to be extremely powerful. So when you look at violence, um, which is what Green Dot addresses. I don't know if I said that before. Um, Green Dot addresses specifically sexual assault, dating violence, and bullying and harassment. And when you look at those kinds of violence, there are certain factors that indicate that someone might be at a higher risk for experiencing violence. And we simply call those risk factors. On the flip side, there are also factors whose presence indicates that someone might be less likely to experience violence. And when I say experience violence, I mean they might be less or more likely to um, be the victim of that violence or to maybe be the creator or the perpetrator of that violence. So the things that make it less likely for us to experience violence are called protective factors. So very basic, pretty much makes sense. Um, one of these protective factors, and this is an evidence-based protective factor, is a feeling of a sense of community and connectedness with the people around you. And I think that that is particularly one of the biggest protective factors that we wanna build when we're doing our work with libraries. So all of the programs that libraries are doing and just by being institutions in the neighborhoods and in the communities that you're in, you're already building those protective factors. So today we're gonna to be talking about how I've worked with some of the libraries on a program I'm doing um, and like I said before, I'm really happy to get your thoughts. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to ask you guys a poll question um, about your experience with teens who have different experiences. So Krista, this is, I believe, the first poll question that they can right. pull up if yep. you want to pull yeah, this All right, so uh, there we go. You just get okay. lunch. There we go. I was like, oh, I can't see. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to read the question out loud. It's going to look a little different than on the screen because I'm I'm very wordy, and there are word limits. Yes, we had <laughs> to limits on how long the and short the questions could be. So this is a bit abbreviated, but I got all the important parts in there. I think exactly. So I'll read it out. Uh, so. 
Just want to hear from you real quickly. Have you or your staff ever worked with a teen patron, or if you're not necessarily in the library field, um, a teen client, a teen just in general, um, who has been affected by poverty, homelessness, depression, suicide, substance abuse, dating violence, sexual assault, or bullying? It's a lot of things, uh, which is why we have these answers. So you can pick mm -hmm. yes, all of these, yes, some of these, yes, one of these, or no, none of these at all. All right, so I want to get all of you guys to answer. Please. <laughs> And I can, well, okay. I can't tell who has or hasn't, but I know that not everybody has just yet. Okay. Um, we do, I know we do have commission staff on the line here, um, which probably this wouldn't, well, wouldn't apply to us. I don't know that we get teens that come in here. Um, or like, so would commission staff, you guys probably work, you serve the people who serve those teens, right? Right. We work with the libraries. Yeah. And the librarians. Yeah. Okay, so if you maybe have you heard of in the libraries that you serve mm -hmm. that these are issues that they're dealing with. Yeah. And if any of my questions are seem kind of weird or wonky or don't apply to you, let one of us know, like just yeah, type, type it in the text down. box and um, I can read This is just the poll that, you know, that we put together, but um, yeah, type into the question section if you have some sort of comment on it or why you didn't want to answer whichever way. Um, I think we'll close the polls up now in about five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. All right, and then we'll show. Okay. There's our answers. Okay. So out of everybody who answered, uh, everybody has seen at least multiple forms of this yeah. kind of violence. Okay, mm -hmm. let's pull up the next question. I was going to the next one. Okay. Um, yep. Next one up is do to do, do watch. Okay. So was that teens, and you guys may or may not know this, which is why we have an I don't know, was that teen's sexual orientation, gender identity? disability or socioeconomic status a reason they experienced whatever it was that they had experienced from the question before yes no or i don't know So all of you that answered the first one, make sure you answer this one. I should get the same amount. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make participation as easy as possible. <laughs> there we go. All right. That looks like it is everyone from the first one. All right. So we will show this one. Okay. Yeah. So in most cases, these are things that are contributing factors. Um, thank you guys for answering those questions. I think, so the reason that I ask them is because a lot of times, like today I will be talking about specifically about violence, but all of these things intersect. And so a lot of times we don't necessarily have one, like a teen will come to us with one particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's important for us to illustrate and establish as we move into this. So I'm going to be talking about teen dating violence and sexual mm -hmm. assault prevention specifically, but you might also have different ideas around maybe substance abuse is particularly crazy in your area, or mm -hmm. maybe you've seen lots of teens with thoughts of suicide or depression. Um, so know that that is something that I'm aware of, and that's something that we can talk about in our discussion towards the end. Okay, I'm going to pull back my PowerPoint. Yep, there you go. Okay, um, which that leads us into, I was looking through, uh, somebody had sent me an article from, it was called Public Libraries and At-Risk Teens. I don't remember where it was published, but I pulled this quote from it because I thought it was really powerful. Um, it says, all teens are at risk. They're at risk of falling prey to ignorance, hatred, violence, and all the other negative influences that surround them of failing to take advantage of the opportunities and resources available to them, 
everything we do here in the teen lounge serves at risk teens. And I thought this was really powerful because a lot of times um, we use the phrase at risk teens. And what we mean is teens who are more vulnerable than others uh, to kinds of violence. So that last poll question that I had where we talked about a teen's sexual orientation or their gender identity or their socioeconomic status, um, people who identify as something other than what we deem as the norm, so people who don't identify as heterosexual or don't identify as cisgender um, or have less access to financial resources, usually they have higher rates of violence. I don't know why that is, um, but they're just higher risk. And what I like about this quote is that it says, well, all teens are at risk. We need to be engaging all teens. And that's one of the things that I love about libraries is because I feel like they are equalizers in our communities. So regardless of what people are bringing to the table, what their identities are, what their experiences are, um, they're welcome at the library. They're able to engage in programming and find people who are similar to them in general. I know that this maybe isn't a blanket rule for everybody, um, but that has been my experience. So I like to, to highlight this quote. Um, and it leads really well into the idea of why I think libraries are really great spaces. Um, so, uh, because they're just such great spaces for relationship building. Um, and today, in case you haven't picked up on it, we're going to focus on teens. Uh, but teen librarians do this relationship building really, really well. I don't think I've ever met one who, who I haven't seen a teen come in and get excited to talk to them. Um, and relationships are essential to learning. So, I may not be a teacher in a classroom. I am in a classroom, but I'm not there every day. You as librarians or the, the library, the librarians that you serve if you're um, commission members, um, we're all teachers. We're trying to interact with people and teens in such ways that, that they're learning how to interact and have healthy relationships with people. Um, so we've got those other skills to teach, like having conversations and working in groups and socializing and how to take care of each other in general. And we all have a role to play in building strong communities to support and develop teens, as well as making it clear to teens where they can go if something does go wrong. Um, so the strategy that rape crisis centers across Kentucky, which is my state, have used for the last near 10 years to help build relationships with and equip teens to become active bystanders is called Green Dot. Um, so I'll talk about this for the rest of the webinar or for the most of it and how I've brought this particular strategy uh, to libraries. Some things to keep in mind just in general before I jump into some Green Dot basics is that community partnership they're, they're crucial to forming a cohesive response to the complex issues that teens face today. As we saw in those poll questions, we're dealing with teens who are dealing with compounded issues. Lots of stuff is happening. And I really like the idea of having diverse partnerships uh, because these issues, they don't just happen in a vacuum and they don't just have one cause. So what that means is that we need a lot of people to be able to address these different things and working on it together makes so much more sense. Um, I know that what I can provide as the green dot person can simultaneously supplement and be strengthened by working with the local library, working with the local substance abuse coalition, working with the mental health agency. Um, we all bring these really beautiful things to the table. And I love the idea of working in collaboration. Although, yes, that is much easier said than done. Okay, so jumping into Green Dot a little, I'm going to give you a little bit of background first. So it started, it was a program that started at the University of Kentucky probably 12 or 13 years ago. So college campus, um, fairly large. I don't know how many people are at the University of Kentucky, but I think it's a pretty large, large school. Um, and Basically, the founder of Green Dot 
realized that we had been doing, we as a rape crisis prevention movement had been doing very similar work for the last 30 or 40 years, basically going into spaces and telling people, okay, if you're a woman, this is how to reduce your risk of, of being victimized by this. So this is how to protect yourself. And if you're a man, don't do this. Don't sexually assault somebody. Don't rape somebody. And the founder of Green Dot had this kind of epiphany moment where she was like, hmm, that doesn't seem like a really great way to engage people. <laughs> um, it's not working. It's not effective. We're not seeing any results. Our numbers are still just as high as they were 40 years ago. So she decided to create a program that came from the bystander perspective. So instead of engaging people as potential perpetrators or potential victims, we are engaging them as allies and as active bystanders. Like you have a way, there's a way that you can stop people from getting hurt around you. And how do we train people and equip them to do that? Uh, so this was uh, studied at the University of Kentucky. They went into, I think, a randomized controlled trial. Uh, the CDC did at the college level and this strategy was found to be effective in reducing violence. So the state of Kentucky went to them and said, hey, we want to adapt this for our high schools, which is where the program that I work for comes in. We were part of that initial pilot study is what they called it. The CDC came in and funded a five year pilot study where 13 schools got green dot and 13 high schools were basically the controls. What they found is that green dot, the green dot strategy reduces violence by about 20%, the perpetration of sexual violence in particular, by about 20% in the schools that had it. So this is huge. It's one of two evidence-based programs for high school students uh, recognized by the CDC in the country. So pretty big deal. So that's just some background into the, the formation of the program. If you're curious, if you wanna talk about that more, feel free to leave questions or call me or email me after the webinar and I'm happy to talk more about it. What I really wanna talk about though is the, the strategy behind it. So what are the concepts so that you can understand what we're doing with the library specifically? So um, what we start out with is this image of a map. And if you've ever seen a like zombie outbreak movie or a virus outbreak movie, you'll probably have an image in your head of something similar. So usually there's a cluster of red dots in one city or in one town. And what that means is that city has an outbreak of whatever the virus is. And then somebody will say something like, oh, if we don't find a cure in two weeks or in a month, then this is what it's gonna look like. And you have a map similar to what you see on your screen that's just covered in red dots. And that basically means that everybody's a zombie and we're all eating each other's brains and it's, it's not a good thing. Um, so we at Green Dot, we take this image and we apply it to violence. So instead of imagining maybe a world map, maybe you imagine a map of your community um, or even a map of Nebraska and imagine that it is covered in red dots. But instead of those red dots being zombie cooties or a virus, those red dots represent any individual action that somebody has taken to hurt somebody else. So, um, we don't know how many red dots are covering the Nebraska map or covering the Kentucky map. Um, it's not it's not like matched one for one. We haven't been able to quite track that. Um, but what we do know is that a lot of people are getting hurt. So I looked at in preparation for today, I looked at the youth risk behavior survey uh, for Nebraska specifically so that I could give you guys some numbers so that you have a little bit of a grasp of how many of your teens this is particularly affecting. So what that told me, and these numbers come from the 2015 survey, is that about 8% of teens in your state had been physically abused by a dating partner. Uh, about slightly more, it's like 8.3% of teens were forced to have sex against their will. This is within the last year, um, high school students. 
26 percent uh, have been bullied on school property and almost 20 percent were bullied electronically so if that gives you any indication of how red dot covered your map is um that's kind of that's kind of i don't know that's kind of the point um that's a lot of people getting hurt that's a lot of teens getting hurt uh one in ten for sexual assault or for dating violence is just mind-blowing to me um and that's why i do the work that i do so other examples of red dots that you might see um, or that you might have heard about so that is every instance of someone posting something like nasty on instagram or twitter about a classmate that's a red dot Every instance of someone forcing someone else to have sex is a red dot. Each private nude photo shared without somebody's consent is a red dot. And every time someone calls their partner worthless or tries to control what they're doing or who they're seeing, those are each red dots. So I don't know what the norms look like in your communities, um, but these are some of the ones that plague us here in Kentucky. If you have, other examples of red dots that I've missed because there are a bunch or things that you've seen particularly in your regions and in your neighborhoods, go ahead and throw them in the in the chat box um, and Krista can share those in a second if, if you guys have any ideas for what you've seen. Um, and I'm going to move on and talk about what a green dot is while you guys are thinking and answering that question. Okay, so the solution to these red dots covering our map have to it has to parallel the problem so for us that is a green dot a green dot is any action that somebody takes simply to make it clear that they won't tolerate violence so i talked about somebody sharing a nude photo unwarranted um, or un without consent um, so a green dot to that situation would be checking on the person who maybe that picture is of and making sure that they know about it and they know how to how to take care of themselves and maybe how to address it directly. Um, I also said that one might be when somebody's in an abusive relationship, um, when their partner is calling them worthless. So maybe a really good green dot for that would be <clears throat> excuse me, um, maybe a really gr good green dot for that would be if your friend is the one who is maybe saying those really awful things saying like, hey, why are you treating them like that? Or that's not cool. Um, if, I don't know if people say cool anymore. I say cool a lot, but, but teens don't really. Uh, that's just my language. Um, maybe do, it's, yeah. it's, what? I do, yeah, maybe too much. Yeah. <laughs> what do they say then? Yeah, I mean, I know, like, I'm trying to, like, I don't even know. Like, I know they say it's lit a lot, um, uh, but that's for something that's good. I mean, that <laughs> um, so we know how to communicate, yes. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, sometimes a green dot could be getting a mutual friend to do something because you don't actually like the person getting hurt. Or maybe it's just creating a distraction so that that sexual assault doesn't play out or so whatever that scene is isn't playing out. Um, so notice that I gave different kinds of examples there. Uh, we call those different examples the three Ds, direct, delegate, and distract, because we know that we as adults all have barriers. Like I can't count the number of times I've been in a store, in a public space, in my neighborhood, and I've had that gut feeling like, I know I should do something, this is wrong, but I have barriers. Like, but I'm shy, but I'm running late but i don't know the person but what if i just don't really know what the situation is what if this what if they're actually joking and this isn't actually a serious situation we all have those barriers that pop up so we know that teens have barriers too um, and that's why we try to give people options because we want them to be able to work around those barriers rather than just telling them to get over them Ultimately, we just want more green dots on the map than red. So the best green dot is the one that someone actually does rather than the one that somebody thinks they should do, but for whatever reason can't do. Um, 
So we also train students on proactive green dots that they can do before they ever see any instance of violence. Uh, because a lot of teens say, well, I don't actually see somebody getting sexually assaulted, or I don't even see the red flag warning signs for that, or I haven't seen anyone get bullied personally. Um, so we want to make sure that everybody has the ability to, to be a part of this movement, even if that is just making it clear by posting on social media or by starting a conversation with people around them that they care about this issue. Because what we're after with Green Dot is culture change. And the more individuals who add Green Dots to the map, the more we shift culture away from violence. So we're going to do some more poll questions now. And these are actually going to be questions of, I'm going to give you guys a scenario. And you're going to get to figure out what is the green dot that you would do in that situation. So some of them are going to be from the perspective of, you as a library services professional, if you happen to be in a library, um, some of them are going to be from the perspective of a, of a teen, just to help build a little bit of empathy with what teens might be going through. Mm -hmm. Okay, Krista, do you want okay. to pull up the, the first one? one? Sure. Okay, the so first the first one, you overhear some teens talking about a super embarrassing photo that was posted on social media of another teen. Would you direct check in with the subject of the photo? You have another option for direct ask who posted it and ask that person to take it down. Would you delegate so you encourage or ask them to report it to the site? Or would you distract you challenge them to bury the post with positive posts or memes or whatever? What would you do? There aren't any right or wrong answers, just a lot of options. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and yeah, select which one you think would be the most. Now I should have asked, I didn't ask when you were setting these up, Lori, um, would this be something that more than one answer could be, or are we just looking for, you know, your first instinct? Uh, well, yes to both of them. <laughs> so <laughs> this is definitely something where when we get into the discussion part of it, especially when we do this exercise with students, a lot of students will say, I would do this and this. So more than one answer is acceptable, but I think the technology is probably just one answer. So what's your well, like, yeah, first? I didn't even think about that at the time. And I, when I was setting these up this morning, we, I, yeah, this, this one is set to just be um, yeah. one choice. And that's okay. When we do it in set, when we do it in actual trainings, we usually only have one choice. But then we oh, okay. have discussion afterward to fill it up. So that's okay. I didn't. I also did not make that clear. <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to get your answer in? What you think would be the first thing you would do? I can tell not everybody has clicked yet, so please do make a choice before we wrap this one up. We got a few other ones coming too, so be prepared. Yeah. You guys don't actually have to say anything, which is nice, right? You just click a button. Yes. All right, I think we'll close this one up and so we can get our answers. Okay. Okay. So a lot of you guys are direct. Awesome. Not that if you're a delegate or distract, that's not awesome. Um, but yeah, a lot of you guys are really direct, which is not necessarily surprising being in the position that you're in here. Okay, let's pull up the next one. Okay, um, I do have a comment that someone has about this one of, of yeah, another option. Great. Is that okay to do that now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, someone said, I'd check in with the subject, talk to the poster, the person who did it, and since I'm in a public library and cannot act as a parent, I usually um, contact a school counselor about these types of things as well, because they have more reach than I do. Nice. So reaching, awesome. even, this is all about doing time. things just within the library, except for that reporting it to the site, but reach out to the yeah. school. Yes, you definitely can. That is a great response. Great idea. All right, okay. do the next one. Do the next one. Okay. So the next question is gonna be um, pretty much the same scenario, but it's, it's asking you to think about if you were in the teen's position. 
So it's your friends showing you a super embarrassing photo of a classmate that was posted on social media. What would you do if you were a teen? So you don't necessarily have authority the way that you do in a library um, or as an adult, even with the age difference. Would you check in with the subject to see if they're okay? Would you ask who posted it and ask that person to take it down? Would you report it to the site or would you begin burying it with unrelated funny, funny memes? And if you have thoughts on like how your answer has changed, we'll see in a second, um, because your barriers maybe would have changed as a teen or maybe not. All right, I think that might be everyone who's going to answer. Okay. But if you have any comments, go ahead and type them in too. Okay. So this one, this, this kind of mm -hmm. makes sense, right? Um, I suspect that we have more delegates in this particular one because it probably feels a little bit more confrontational to ask that person to take it down when they're oh, your yeah. peer. I can feel that would be pretty... That would be pretty intimidating for me. And I should give you some full disclosure. So for me, I'm not a direct person at all. I'm pretty consistently a delegate or distract, um, mm -hmm. I find, when I do these scenarios with high school students and with community members. Um, so really, there isn't a right or wrong answer here. Yeah. I think I would be too, try, try those first. But I do have my breaking point <laughs> of yes. where I yes. am this is going been going on for too long i'm gonna i'm gonna talk to the person and we're gonna get this stopped right yeah, yeah. and so one of the maybe things you start with one way and end up the other <laughs> mm -hmm. yep that always comes up in our trainings like students are like but what if that doesn't work <laughs> so then we have like these conversations about like okay so sometimes green dots won't work what do you do then next you know like what's your next step how do you think on your feet Okay, we got two more questions, guys. Okay, so you're, uh, you're an adult again. Uh, one of your regular teens comes to you and tells you that there's an older patron in the teen space. Your teen looks pretty uncomfortable with this. Um, so what would you do? You would be direct. You would politely ask him to relocate within the library. Would you delegate? You ask an adult services librarian to do the above, because um, maybe you, uh, maybe you as the teen librarian aren't necessarily super comfortable doing that. Whatever, or you just ask a fellow librarian. Um, mm -hmm. Distract. Go into the teen space and start a teen activity um, to maybe try and get the teen's attention away, and that would simultaneously give you the opportunity to maybe keep an eye on things. What would you do? I think the, the second one of delegating, I, I was thinking as you we were talking about this, that mm -hmm. so this is talking about there's an older patron, not a teen is in the teen yes. space. Yeah, that potentially if asking either an adult services librarian or another librarian who isn't just the teen focused one, um, they may even know this person if it's a, an, an a yeah. adult patron who they've interacted with in either good or bad ways, you never know. Sometimes people wander into the wrong areas by mistake. Um, yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. Sometimes I do. That's a great point too. It's like sometimes we're uncomfortable because we don't necessarily know the person and we think things will be better coming from somebody that they know. And that's yeah. a really great, it's a really great point. Yeah. Or someone who's the authority in the area they are normally in the rest of the library. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. That looks like everybody we will close and yeah. share this one. Okay. So most of us feel pretty comfortable just politely asking him to relocate within the library. And some of us are like, uh, let's get somebody else to do this. <laughs> totally fine. Neither one is better. Okay, last mm -hmm. poll question. This group is not full of distractors. I think that's interesting. <laughs> oh. Okay. You're in the teen space, so we're back to being a teen again. You're in the teen space with your friends. An older patron comes in again. 
you know he makes your friend uncomfortable with some of the things he said before. So what would you do in this situation as a teen? Would you kindly ask him to leave the teen space or maybe not so kindly, maybe a little bit sassy? <laughs> um, would you delegate? I can just imagine a teen being like, uh, this is the teen space. <laughs> um, <laughs> totally um, snarky, yes. Yeah, yes, uh, or delegate. You find one of the librarians to do the above uh, or distract. You ask your friend to help you in another area. Maybe you could say, hey, uh, I'm going to go pick out a book for my brother and the kids section want to help me. Something like that. All right. That was pretty quick. Uh, looks like everyone's wow. done this one and, um, wow, pretty, 100%. <laughs> pretty okay. quick and consistent. Yes. Very consistent. Nice. Okay. So, um, which is awesome. The reason that I like to do this particular exercise with people is a, to build empathy with teens, but also to help us familiarize ourselves with, um, with what our barriers are, like what our own barriers, what our own options are. Like we can all do green dots. It's not just something for high school students. So um, that will be we, we a comment from someone about oh, both these yes. last two um, that yes. they said in their oh. library, we had a rather consistent and large problem with this kind of thing in my library. So it eventually became straight up, ask them to vacate the area. We had to ban some people because they would wait outside for teens and then try to follow them. We have had bad oh. things happen to some of our teens with so just zero tolerance. Yeah, that is a, that is a super creepy situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, so I pulled these scenarios from our Kentucky teen librarians. Um, so these are things that happen here and I wasn't sure if they were, what, if they happened, if you guys experienced them as well. But so that's, thank you for sharing that. I'm glad that you guys took action to protect those teens. Not that that, not that I wouldn't, not that I would assume that you wouldn't do that, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you guys handled that situation really well whoever made that comment. That's sometimes where you have to get to, like it gets to that point, yeah. Or yeah, if you know yeah. that there's a specific incident and you have to start off with the zero tolerance, you're out. I mean, in each library mm -hmm. is gonna be spe you know, specific to your situation. Yes, Potentially. yes, yeah. very much so. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna fly through some of these. We just did these, I just had slide holders for them. <laughs> um, so that that leads me to the work that I've done with local libraries. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples um, that are that are tangible. Um, and the reason that I I started, the reason that I reached out to the libraries in the first place is because we work primarily with high school students. Um, we implement these trainings. So what you just got was a very 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 brief overview of what we do in high schools and in communities in our area. Um, and so what we realized is with high school students, they're not in high school all the time. Of course, they're there for eight hours a day. And so we want to reach them there. But we wanted to also build into the adults who have a lot of power over the environments that teens are in outside of school. So mm -hmm. we're, we were looking at where do teens work a lot? Where do they play a lot? Where do they pray a lot? Like all of those things. Um, and so one of the first places that I came to was the library because lots of teens go there for programming or for books and because it's so close to the school in the community that I'm particularly in. So they seemed like a natural partner to me. Plus I, li I love libraries. So as I've probably made clear. <laughs> um, so here are some examples of, of what I have done. And these slides are gonna be available to you guys and I have what I'm saying in the notes of all of the slides. So uh, you can take notes, but also don't feel pressured to like try to get it, to capture absolutely everything that I'm saying. Um, so in general, there are a few kind of categories that I would classify my work with libraries falling into. All of them, I think, help 
me to build stronger relationships with adults in the community that I'm working in with teens in the community that I'm working in. Um, and so I think that's just kind of the underlying theme here. Um, so some different ways that I approached when I approached initially, uh, I approached the teen librarian for obvious reasons, um, wanting to know like, Hey, can I just help you with your current programming? Because, the stuff that you're already doing is is bringing teens in um, and giving me the ability to just, like I said, build relationships with them, let them know who I am and that I'm here. I've been in this particular community for about a year and a half. So everything is everything was pretty new and I don't live in that community. Um, so nobody had really seen me there before. And so I really just wanted to get my face out there and get a feel for like, how do people act here? What what is the language like? What is the culture like? What are the things that get them excited or the things that get them really angry? Um, just so that I can know to help better my interactions with people. Um, so when I approached the teen librarian with volunteering with current programming, she has this late night gaming program where I think it's one Friday a month uh, after the library closes at 9 p.m. Uh, the library basically like reopens to teens only and they can they set up some video games and some of the conference rooms and teens can basically run around, play video games, literally just run around, play board games, talk, eat food and just be themselves. Um, and usually she has between 70 and 100 teens show up for this. So it's a pretty, pretty big event as far as this particular life particular library goes. And I just offered, hey, do you need an extra set of hands there? I'll show up, I can wear my green dot t-shirt so that if students ask me, what is green dot, I can tell them. And even, because uh, most of these teens, they're like pre, they're middle school teens, so they're young teens. Um, I'm just building relationships with them, playing video games with them, playing board games with them, so that in a couple of years when they go on to high school and I come to their class and talk about Green Dot, they're going to be like, oh, hey, I remember this person. And maybe it will make them a little bit more likely to listen to what I'm saying and receive that Green Dot message really well. Plus, it'll help them identify where the resources are in their community. And just building positive relationships with adults is another protective factor. Um, so I started to get in on that. Um, the other kind of category that I that I pick up is raising green dot awareness in the community. So this is kind of like volunteering with community pro with current programming is something that I recognize. Like I can't go into a library and just be like, hey, I need this and I need this and I need this. Like I want this to be a reciprocal relationship. So that's why I started with like, how can I help you? Yes, there's a benefit to me too, but like what are you guys doing that's already amazing that I can get in on and enhance? Um which one current program that the library that I'm in does is called the Haunted Library. Uh, so it's around Halloween and basically they shut down the library and they turn it into a into a haunted library. And this draws, I think the adult services librarian told me it draws like a thousand people from all over the county. It's it's by far and away their yeah. biggest event. Yeah, That's I mean, it's, cool. it, it is yeah. huge. And so it's families and kids. And so what the line does is it snakes around the entire the entire library like through bookshelves and all this stuff and so i was like well do you guys need somebody to do line activities so my students and i created a name that tune game and what they did was i took a group of high school students on the different times when it was open and the high school students were able to approach all of the different patrons tell them who they were what green dot was and then play a game with them um, and so it raised awareness about green dot in the community but it also gave my high school students an opportunity to get comfortable talking about what green dot is and why they care about it which is huge because they don't get that practice every day um, and so that was a really huge program for me with the adult services librarian, um, I actually got to focus a little bit more on like I've joined a book club so that I can just engage with adults in the community for that recognition piece like, hey, I'm a part of this community, too, even if I don't live here. Um, and then there was also um, 
she's given me the opportunity to be a guest speaker at already existing events. So one of the big ones is they have a series of ceramic painting, um, not classes, but programs before Christmas. And she said, this is our biggest, this is our biggest adult program of the year because everybody comes because you paint a piece of ceramic and then you can give it away as a Christmas gift. And so she had four or five of those. And she was like, I'll give you five or 10 minutes or really as long as you want to talk to people while they're painting. And so I was able to talk to people about green dot, um, while they were painting. And then after I was done talking, I just painted and talked to the community and was just me, another patron who was attending this program, um, which was really cool. Um, and then we are also working together to offer new programming at the library for patrons that is involving Green Dot themes. So one of them is the teen librarian has a homeschool hangout session. Uh, so all of the homeschool students, they basically come in on the first Wednesday of the month uh, for, for different programs. And so I was a featured speaker at one of them. And this was really cool to me because since we work so much in the high school system, we miss anyone who is in who is a homeschool student. And so this was my way of saying like, hey, just because you're not in a high school doesn't mean that you're not seeing or experiencing these kinds of violence and doesn't mean that you're not, that you don't need to be equipped to be able to intervene in these situations. So we had some really, really great conversations, particularly around bullying and how much they see it um, in their church in their church groups, as well as in their work lives. Um, and so we had really great conversations around that. And then we're also um, going to hopefully be engaging parents. I have some sessions scheduled for May and June. Um, and you guys are probably realizing, you guys probably know this already, that calling a program violence prevention and hoping that adults will show up is not really an effective strategy um, because people don't really want to show up to something about violence. Um, but what we thought of the librarian, the adult librarian and me, um, is we are going to be doing a college prep for parents. So how to prepare your teacher, but our frame is less of an academic preparation and more of what are some of the experiences that your teen might face when they're in college and how do we prepare them and how do you as parents support them when they go to a party and they see something happen mm -hmm. um, or just by being on campus. So I'm really excited about that offering and so is our adult services librarian. Uh, so we're going to be doing two of those. And then finally, we're also looking at training the county library staff. So I work with one particular library and our county has three libraries. So we're looking at equipping staff countywide um, on, on basic Green Dot concepts. So how do you respond when these things are happening in your library? Because they, I mean, anywhere people are, these things happen. And so just helping library staff to feel more equipped and ready to handle situations that they might need to de-escalate or they might need to report. So when we when I gave you those examples before, um, that's exactly what we're talking about. When that when you have adult patrons who are who are kind of being creepy with the teens, when you have teens or adults who are treating each other in ways that aren't really good, how do we respond? So those are some of the examples that I have. I know we are, man, I talked a lot. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so we have, a, we have a couple of minutes left and I just have, if you guys don't have thoughts or questions already that you're thinking, um, I put some questions up here that, that might be helpful or that I might be able to help answer or bounce ideas off of. So, one is about what are some barriers that you can think of um, to incorporating some of these ideas that I've talked about, or even maybe you're really excited, hopefully, after you're hearing this. And so maybe you have some ideas on how you could start incorporating even just some of these principles and concepts um, as you return to your work. And then this one is really more for Encompass, like what are some ideas for professional development that you might like to see mm -hmm. <laughs> on yeah. this or related topics? 
Yeah. So, um, yeah. So yeah, yeah this, anyway, go ahead and um, type in if you have any, um, <clears throat> any, 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 other, any other questions, of course, for Lori about this program. Um, and I'll pull and, my, uh, co my contact information is up on the last slide. So that's the next slide. So I'll, sure. I'll toss that up there in a second and you guys will have that. So you can always, you can always ask me, call me or email me in person. Yeah. Um, yeah, so either any questions you have or any answers you have to these questions here. Um, any yeah. idea, you know, have you thought about incorporating these in your area, your libraries? Is there something you've done that is similar to this um, that you want to share? Um, let us know. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I was going to, well, we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions. Um, that When we do post up the um, archive for this, as Lori said, her slides, I've already got them. They'll be available as well. So you have all this mm -hmm. information. And I've also got links to the um, Green Dot website and the Women's Crisis Center where there's more information about what's going on with it and um, also Lori and other educators there um, contact information too. So you'll have a lot of resources to work on something like this in your area. Now this is Green Dot, um, Greater Cincinnati, can Northern Kentucky. There are, yes. is, is there are other ones regional there elsewhere are. in the country? Yes. So Green Dot uh, is actually a strategy. The company that, I guess it's a company, that owns Green Dot or that does Green Dot at the national and international levels is called Altruistic. It's A-L-T-E-R-I-S-T-I-C, um, which I can send that to you, Krista. So they're the ones who do it at the national level. Um, and then we, green.gcky, is our just local chapter. So there are places, college campuses, rape crisis centers, um, health departments across the, the country who are doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and so you might, if you just Google Green Dot, you'll get either a credit card, <laughs> which is not what we want. Um, <coughs> or on Green Dot. Right. Or you might get um, other chapters of Green Dot, I guess you would call them. Right. And I don't actually know who in Nebraska is doing Green Dot, but that's something that I could that I could look up and try to find out. My guess would be that some colleges are at least. Now I keep coming up with uh, credit cards. Um, yeah, that was that's an unfortunate coincidence. It's the one we always, when we go into presentations and we're like, yeah, we're from Green Dot. And they're like, oh yeah, like Steve Harvey. <laughs> we're like, no, <laughs> that's not, uh, okay. that's not us. <laughs> you add in, if you want to find out more. So altruistic, you can find, yes. Um, yep. uh, just adding in the word in a Google search with violence. We'll get rid of the ones that have to do with credit cards. <laughs> so nice. I did the Green Dot Violence Nebraska. And it came up with actually the al altruistic.org website. Um, oh, cool. Um, oh, hey, uh, we uh, looks like we have, um, yeah, the, uh, hi, Rhonda. Uh, Ron, I'll, I'll just name you since you said Rhonda Jackson is from the uh, Florida Department of Health, and she says Florida Green Dot is on the line. So there's a Florida group. So one of your colleagues. Hi. Hey, Rhonda. I just talked to Rhonda last week, and she said oh. she was going to be. <laughs> and I got real excited. She's pretty awesome. Yeah. They're doing some amazing work throughout Florida. Uh, it looks like uh, Creighton University and the University of Nebraska at Omaha have gotten involved in um, mm -hmm. Green Dot. Um, do, here's a green, oh, that's Alaska. That's the wrong state. Never mind. Um, <laughs> so UNO has a UNO Green Dot and Creighton are the first ones that I'm coming up with. Yeah. So we do have a couple cool. um, based out of our colleges, actually, is what this is then. Nice. Yeah. Yes. And so those might be good partners if you happen to be in one of the libraries surrounding or near one of those areas. Mm -hmm. These are both in Omaha. Yeah. But that was just a quick okay. search I did um, just off the top of my head here. Cool. And also I should say, like, it doesn't, um, you don't necessarily need to partner with anyone to start or you don't necessarily need to partner with a green dot specific agency. You could always reach out to who is your local domestic violence or rape crisis center 
and what are what are the prevention or education pieces that they're doing or what are those what could those partnerships with them look like um because it's going to be different in every single community mm -hmm. so well, this is interesting and i wasn't sure if this was accurate uh uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln, because we have multiple University of Nebraska campuses in um, mm -hmm. the state. There's the Omaha one is the first one I found, but this is in Lincoln. Uh, someone has uh, done their dissertation on the Green Dot program. Mm. And it's posted, yeah, the process of engagement with the Green Dot bystander, bystander intervention program among higher education staff and faculty. And this is oh. a dissertation that someone has done that's up through the Women's, Stody, women's Studies um, Counseling Psychology uh, subject area. Oh, I might have to look that up. I'll send you the link, yeah. yeah um, we have a comment here or uh, question. Uh, you talked about a parent session to prep them for helping their child ready for college. Um, yes. Do you plan any collaboration with colleges and your universities to provide the programming? The transition is often tough for kids. Yes, um, that is a great question. Thank you for asking it. So um, I don't have any active partnerships with colleges right now, but I think that that is a great resource for me to explore, as well as one of the things that I'm gonna do in preparation for this. So I haven't actually developed all the content yet, but one of the things that I'm gonna do in preparation is we're gonna do parent surveys. So because we're connected with Women's Crisis Center and because the library is doing this, we might have a lot of parents out there um, that will help us gather information. Parents of kids who are going to college, kids who have been in college or who are currently in college. And so I'm hoping to glean some information in that way. And then the third piece is also my current director. Um, the She is the prevention director for Women's Crisis Center. So she's over our team. She actually was one of the original founding members of Green Dot at the University of Kentucky. And so she, she probably worked on UK's campus for between five and 10 years, um, working directly with people, with college students um, at their, it's called the VIP center, but that's basically where somebody, so if somebody is sexually assaulted on campus, if somebody um, is in an abusive relationship, they would go to the VIP center to seek services. Um, so she worked there as well as doing Green Dot. So she has a lot of insight into this transition into college as well. But that's a that's a that's a great suggestion. I might reach out. I have some contacts up here with colleges. We just haven't we mm -hmm. haven't made that um, partnership official or that reach out yet. But yeah, but obviously I, it, I, it yeah. is. I mean, you haven't done that. You've been working maybe with a public library, so obviously it's been done. It's, as I just did that. You know, a couple of universities here in Nebraska. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, for sure. And so we do know, uh, so we have, being close to Cincinnati, we have quite a few universities that are close to us. And I do know which ones have Green Dot. So Northern Kentucky University is a Green Dot school. Mm -hmm. um, so I do know those and I know, but they're like kind of, it's like they're doing their own thing. We have, we should partner more than what we do mm -hmm. for sure. Which just goes to show you, uh, partnerships are difficult, <laughs> and we all have limited amounts of time. <laughs> yes. Oh, and actually, this this person, uh, Susie, one of our librarians, she's the one who's asked that last question. Is here in Nebraska. She actually, yeah, I will. I'll send the link for the dissertation out to everybody when we do their archive. I'll post it up there as well, so you'll all have access to it. Yes, that's a good idea. I should have not just said I'm only going to send it to you. <laughs> <Don't worry>. um, <laughs> Yeah, and um, and maybe I'll maybe the links to the two that we do know of because I did find there is actual green dot websites for both at both Creighton and UNO about their programs. So yeah, um, Kristen, there's a, on top of it. yeah. So um, it looks like there was an article from 2014 when they were both getting started and they were talking about. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, Nebraska College is raising awareness on campus sexual assaults and other other universities in the state doing other things, um, but participating oh, cool. in other programs, having their own things. And then just UNO and Creighton were the ones that were doing the green dot um, back in 2014, starting it up there, yeah. Nice. So, all right. Anything else over there? 
Yeah, anybody have any other last minute questions? We're a little after 11 o'clock, but that's okay. Um, officially, Encompass Live does go 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time, but um, we go as long as is necessary for everyone's thing to be done and everyone to get their questions answered. Um, Susie does say, yes, thank you very much. This is an important topic. It, yes, absolutely. And Thank you uh, so much, Susie. Get the, get the word out there, yeah. So there is Lori's contact info if you do want to jot that down to get in touch with her. As I said, the slides will be available as well with her archive. So okay. any last minute desperate questions you want to ask urgently right this minute before we wrap up? Get typed in. <laughs> Um, as I said, the recording will be available. It'll be um, probably later this afternoon. I'll have it done and processed and up on the website. Everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's show will get an email. Um, I'll send it to you as well, Lori, so you have, you know, where it all is Thank posted. Um, we'll have the slides and we'll have links to that dissertation um, and some other things that I found that Nebraska specific um, and that altruistic site too, because that came up too in my results, which was cool. The Perfect. originating organization of the Green Dot um, program. See what else they are involved in as well. Well, it doesn't look like anybody is typing in anything. Has typed anything now? Unless you're typing some really long novel. I think we will <laughs> um, officially wrap it up for this morning. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much for being with us this morning, Lori. I'm glad that we got. Um, to get this information out, as as people said, this is important. It's a problem. It's and with all the things that Me Too movement and things that are going on, this is definitely something I think I hope will become more common, more prevalent in uh, schools and libraries, um, universities. Yeah, pushing this as a thing, promoting this. I don't know if promoting is the right word. Promoting the program. Yeah, I like promoting. Yeah, pushing sounds I like pushing. <laughs> Yes, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope so too. We're hopeful. Yeah. All right. So I am going to pull back presenter to control the my screen here to wrap up. Um, whoops. Wait, did I do that right? Uh, there we go. All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, on Green Dot. We will be posting it to our Encompass Live website, which I'm going to pop to here. Um, this is our Encompass Live site where we have our upcoming shows, but right underneath them is where our archives go. So here at the top of the list will be the one from today. Um, this is last week's where we had the recording and they had resources that we posted. Same kind of thing. We have a link to, the, to our YouTube recording of this and a link to the slides and then in a couple of websites I'll list here as well. Um, as I said, our archives, this is the 10th year of Encompass Live. So these archives do go back all the way to the very beginning. And I'll, don't get, close your eyes if this makes you seasick. I scroll all the way to the bottom. January 29, 20, 2009 is when we first started. So you will find some historical sessions on here, we'll call it. So um, keep, be aware, everything has a date so you'll know exactly when it did happen live and you go and look. There is also a search feature now in our archives too. So if you're looking for a particular topic, you're not sure when it was, especially since we have 10 years worth now, um, this will search um, titles, descriptions, and presenter fields of all of these sessions. So you can look up something or someone um, in particular if you wanted to find that we, if we did a session on something. Um, so that will be ready, I, I will say this afternoon, as long as YouTube cooperates with um, the processing of the presentation. <laughs> um, so that'll wrap it up for today. That'll be for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is tops and flops of library programs. Um, makes me think of Easter bunnies, topsy and flopsy. Anyway, um, <laughs> I did, that was not on purpose. It's just when it fell into the schedule. Um, Joey Holmes, he is a librarian at Lawrence County Library in South Carolina. He's going to be on the show that's talking about some of their adult programs they've done, um, successes and failures that you can you can learn from both. Um, so he will be um, on with us next week. So please do sign up for that next Wednesday or any of our other upcoming shows. We are booked here, as you can see, all the way through the end of April. And I do already have a couple of sessions uh, confirmed for May that I'll be adding to the calendar as soon as I get the finalized uh, details about that. Um, also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. We've got links you can see here to like our Facebook page. Um, we post over here whenever we are. We have reminders to log into today's shows, when our um, coming what shows that are coming up, and um, when recordings are available. Um, so, if you are a big on Facebook user, um, a big Facebook user, do give us a like over there, and you'll get notices um, from our page about what's going, coming up and happening on Encompass Live. 
other than that, that wraps up for today. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you very much, Lori. And we will see you Thank next you. week on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.